Good morning. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. Iranian-backed Houthis are vowing to respond to the U.S. and British-led airstrikes after those recent attacks. Ed Baxter has that story and more from San Francisco. Ed. Yeah, that's right, Brian. Two days and the U.S. is vowing to continue more attacks after it says dozens of targets were struck in Yemen overnight. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on ABC has heard on Bloomberg says the U.S. is prepared for whatever the Houthis want to bring and that damage to them has really been done. We believe they had good effect in reducing, degrading the capabilities of the militias and of the Houthis. And as necessary, we will continue to take action. And NSC spokesman John Kirby talking about both yesterday and Friday says it will continue. What you saw Friday night was just the first round. Uh, and it's not going to be the last one by any stretch. And Ali al Kahum, a member of the Houthi Political Council, says there is now open war. Meanwhile, Sullivan talking about Israel says a hostage release pause in the war is proving to be elusive and says it is in Hamas court right now. From our perspective, the security of Israel should be sacred. It should not be a political game. And so everyone should get behind a comprehensive package of the kind that bipartisan sen- uh, bipartisan group of senators are negotiating as we speak. Yeah, so going to the package, you may see it uh, from the Senate this afternoon, but House Speaker Mike Johnson on NBC has heard on Bloomberg says there are two packages ready now in the House and wants them moved to the Senate and approved. This border is out of control. All these problems have mounted and the Senate has been dithering ever since. We cannot wait anymore. The reason we are going to send the new Israel package over is because the time is urgent and we have to take care of that responsibility. Now House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries says the uh, bills cannot forget about Ukraine and Asia. First and foremost, certainly to support Ukraine's effort to push back against Russian aggression, also to support our allies in the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, The legislation being put forth by House Republicans does none of that. The responsible approach is a comprehensive one to address America's national security priorities. By the way, Johnson on NBC, when asked directly whether Donald Trump was calling the shots in the House, said, of course not, that he... Johnson is calling the shots. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he does not need any help navigating relations with the U.S. An apparent reference to criticisms from one of his ministers that the Biden administration hasn't fully backed Israel in its war against Hamas. California's coast being battered by some heavy weather, heavy rains, flood warnings from north to the south. It's expected to last most of the day with showers into tomorrow. There has been some flooding in the Monterey area and AT&T at Pebble Beach. Round four has been postponed until tomorrow with hopes of getting it in. So the leaderboard uh, when we stopped yesterday, Wyndham Clark atop at 17 under, Ludwig Oberg at 16 under, Mateja Pavan at uh, 15 under, Mark Hubbard and Thomas uh, Detre at uh, 14 under. Let's hope they can get it in. Some really uh, good shooting out there with uh, definitely less than favorable conditions. And uh, the World Cup 2026 final has been awarded to New York City, beating out Los Angeles and Dallas. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now in San Francisco. I'm Ed Baxter and this is Bloomberg. Brian. Ed, thanks very much. Coming up on 7 Minutes Past the Hour, I'm Brian Curtis along with Doug Krisner and we look at some of the top business stories now. Well, we mentioned a few moments ago that it's been a tough period for Chinese stocks. The CSI 300 was down 6.3% in the month of January, and that was the sixth consecutive month of losses. Well, now China is pledging to stabilize markets after stocks were sinking there. Let's get more on the story from Bloomberg's Bonnie Ao in Hong Kong. The CSI 300 plunged as much as 3.4% before finishing down 1.2%. The China Securities Regulatory Commission vowed to prevent abnormal fluctuations, but it offered no specifics on how to end a sell-off. Investors took to social media to express frustration. The sell-off has erased more than $6 trillion of value in the Chinese economy. The CSRC also said it would guide more funds into the market and that it would crack down on what it calls malicious short selling and insider trading. A lead academic, Liu Yuhui, said China should do more. Liu told state media China should set up a stock stabilization fund as soon as possible. In Hong Kong, I'm Bonnie Ao, Bloomberg Radio. Former President Donald Trump is saying he might impose a new tariff on Chinese goods if elected. Trump told the Washington Post he was considering a 60% tariff on Chinese imports. And when asked about this today on Fox News Sunday Morning Futures, Trump rejected the idea his move could start a trade war. 
You know, obviously, I'm not looking to hurt China. I want to get along with China. I think it's great. But they've really taken advantage of our country. And we turned it around. We put big tariffs on steel. I saved the steel companies. And now Japan is buying U.S. steel. U.S. steel. You know what a name that is? That's the most important name. 50 years ago, there was no company like U.S. steel. Now that Japan is buying it. I don't think I'd let that deal go through, by the way. Former President Donald Trump there. Now, his comments on tariffs only add to the already long list of concerns for domestic Chinese investors. Brian? Well, let's switch to uh, a look at the economy in the U.S. Friday's jobs report shows that U.S. companies boosted payrolls by 353,000 in January. And with the revisions, December's hiring figure also were, was increased. Now, the numbers suggest a reacceleration that is likely to delay any rate cuts for the time being. Mohammed El Aryan, president of Queens College, Cambridge, and a Bloomberg opinion columnist weighed in. Wow. I mean, what, what, an, what an amazing job report. It just confirms that this is an exceptional labor market that's going to feed into the exceptionalism of the U.S. economy. I do think it's a bit of a headache for the Fed because of the wage growth numbers. For your markets, look, this means March is off the table. That's Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohammed El Aryan. U.S. ISM data out later this week could further indicate the Fed's path forward on rate cuts. According to analysis from Bloomberg Intelligence, January's ISM services gauge is expected to rise slightly from December's. Let's get to our guest. Garfield Reynolds joins us, Bloomberg chief correspondent for rates. So we just talked generally here about conditions in the marketplace, Garfield. The strong jobs number uh, sent yields up and the dollar up. Uh, the Atlanta Fed GDP now figure is pointing toward 4.2 percent growth. So there's a slight negative for markets if the Fed is less likely to cut rates. But there is a slight positive for the markets uh, for risk assets uh, that growth like that, um, you know, is is pretty, pretty consistent with earnings. So where are we in terms of the balance uh, on risk? Well, the balance seems to have shifted quite markedly you know, towards risk um, with the only you know, the only lingering concern there is that. Uh, your know, bond yields could move higher, <clears throat> which raises the bar for for valuations. Uh, you know, and the bond yields can move higher because some of those Fed rate cuts that had been priced in, you know, we already lost a little bit. Well, not quite one, but you know, we're now at exactly five rate cuts priced in. At some stages over the last couple of weeks, we were looking at a good chance of a sixth rate cut. So that sixth rate cut is off the table. The March rate cut is off the table. But you know, the reasons why it is off the table are more to do with economic strength than with Fed hawkishness. So for the moment, that that's that's a positive, even if a slightly cautious one, you know, for risk assets, especially because you know, there was some back and forth about it, but you know, a lot of the more important big companies earnings are out and on balance they've been you know at least moderately positive in some cases extremely positive so that sets things up where equities look like outperforming and bonds definitely look like underperforming yeah no doubt about that i mean right now the swaps market i think is indicating that the odds for a move in march to say a cut of 25 basis points that probability is only around 15 percent right now and since Friday, the May contract, the swaps market, is no longer fully pricing in a rate cut. So we're looking farther down the road, no question about it. Let's not forget that consumer sentiment data, which was up in a very, very big way as well. I'm wondering whether you're hearing rumblings, whether people are beginning to express any concern of a reacceleration in inflation. I mean, we know that the market has embraced this idea that inflation has been coming down. That's led us into the conversation around rate cuts. But is there a risk that inflation could pick up? Well, that risk is definitely there. Uh, you know, a couple of things that have been going on to some extent under the surface. We did get a marked increase in break-even rates. You know, the bond market's best estimate of where inflation is going to average over the next you know, number of years, depending on the, the tenor. The two-year break-even rate rose about 30-something basis points in January, which was the biggest monthly increase since last February. So, that's that's a warning. Uh, the thing that has mitigated against that a lot has been the way that 
oil prices have remained lower. You know, even amid mm. what what's been happening in in the Middle East, we haven't seen crude prices significantly advance. And you know, even this morning after we had those attacks over the weekend, it's it's not a huge jump and crude oil sold off quite strongly at the end of last week. So as long as you have crude oil staying in the sort of range it's been, then you don't get that feeding through to gasoline prices, then you don't get your know, both the direct impact on inflation from higher gasoline prices and in particular the sort of thing that worries central bankers, you don't get that feeding into stronger consumer expectations of wow. increased prices. So it's going to be really interesting to watch <coughs> inflation there. Now let's switch to China because we did get an offer of more support from the CSRC. Um, it didn't look like there was anything too specific in there. They did talk about cracking down on what they referred to as malicious short selling and insider trading. Uh, so I raised this point earlier that it still seems to be that Chinese regulators think that it's bad actors that are playing the role here. It's not just... Um, investors losing confidence. Um, so, a two pronged question. One, is this going to work to bring confidence back to the market? And what do we think of the regulators? Well, a Chinese regulators are stuck between a rock and a hard place because, you know, they, if, as long as you've got markets there, markets kind of want to be free. And so you're going to have people wanting to you know, sell short companies that look like the prices are going to fall. Uh, and you're also, you know, it's a bit different. If you're, there, if you're the SEC and the S&P 500 drops by 10%, well, that's not your fault. Uh, it, you know, unless it's some, somebody who's been breaking the rules and you haven't caught them. But there's kind of a, a, an instinct in, in China that you know, under the wise leadership of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party, you know, the common prosperity is the goal and, and things are going to improve. And the economy did end up doing better last year than a lot of people expected, and yet the stock market did worse. So there's definitely some pressure there implicitly and perhaps even explicitly to you know, for regulators to, to make the markets conform better with how the authorities think the economy is is going. The difficulty that they face is that the more they fret and the more they try and impose a direction on equities, the more that's likely to spook investors. Mm. Uh, there was data out over the weekend, I think, um, about you know, strong outflows into, ET, into ETFs to you know, the Chinese investors want to bet on foreign stocks uh, because there the picture is clearer. You, know, you, you can get a better read on where things are going to go. Um, and the other difficulty is that there are some concerns about the Chinese economy's long-term direction. So anytime you manage to goose the share market higher, what you potentially do is offer a more attractive exit point for people who might have gone long earlier. They got trapped. They're looking at a 20% loss. If you can get it to grow 10%, they're going to go, well, right. I think I'm going to take that 10% loss instead of a 20% loss and put my money where I've got a better clue of what's going to happen. So with a deterioration we've been talking about in the equity market in China, along with the problems in the housing market and low confidence, generally speaking, very quickly, uh, Garfield, in about uh, 30 seconds or so, does that mean that the bond market in China is, is where you want to be right now? Well, the bond market certainly looks more likely to perform decently in China. Uh, it's already gained a lot, so that's a concern. The other difficulty you have is, of course, it's a managed currency regime, and that makes it more complicated for investors to get into and out of <coughs> Chinese bonds. But, yeah, they look more attractive than equities at the yeah. moment. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcast. You can also listen live each day on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. 
I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.